Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our January 2021 Exaflix edition. So every month we discuss, review, and talk about films, documentaries, and dramas that relate to computing, computer science, technology, STEM in general. And we've reviewed a few titles so far. Um, this evening, we are going to be discussing the Netflix docu-series called High Score. So it was released in August 2020. So that was just a few months ago for us. It was handy. It was during that big lockdown that we're still in at the moment of recording this. And there are six episodes in total, 35 minutes, 38 minutes. They're all slightly different lengths. And as far as I know, there's only one series. I don't know if there's plans to have some more. And we will talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, there, there are some people who will watch this who have a who teach and might be wondering about sharing aspects of high score. I would just give you a warning. I'm saying it right now at the beginning. Um, there are some words that you would probably not allow in the classroom that are mentioned in high score. They're, they're mostly those sort of very common four letter words that adults exchange when they get annoyed about something or where they don't really believe, really, you're, 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 you're kidding me kind of thing. So I'm just mentioning that right now at the beginning before you think it's a good idea to go off and stick on an episode in front of a class, you might get a little bit of a surprise. Although they won't be words that the children haven't heard before. It's just it may not, you might not be, want to be the one who introduced them into the classroom. Now, what will happen is in a moment, I will ask our panelists to introduce themselves and I will ask Neil to go first Oh, I'm doing it in the order I can see on the screen. So then will be me, Mark, Estelle, Robert, and then Nikki. They're going to tell you a little bit about themselves, what they do maybe. They might also mention a favourite game that they have as they introduce themselves. It's just gone five past eight. The plan is that we're going to spend about 45 minutes or so having a discussion. I've got some questions I've pre-prepared. It may just be open discussion. We'll see how it goes. And... Some of you may agree with what we say or disagree, and that's where we can watch the chat on the stream and you can interact with us. So, Neil, are you ready to tell us who you are, what you do in your favourite game? Yeah, let's go for it. So, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Neil Rickers. I'm a senior lecturer in computing education at the University of Hertfordshire. I also do lots of other bits, including work for the BCS on their CAS programmes and independent writing, reviewing, consulting teaching training all that kind of fun stuff and favorite game i think is probably uh, super mario world on the super nintendo which uh, takes me back quite a, a long time it's probably showing my age but i think it still stands up as one of the best 2d platformers uh, that's been made okay and i'm alan you've just heard from me i'm your host um i work for an organization called Exa Foundation is to try and engage and inspire audiences into computer science and video games is one of those that we do. I would actually put my hand up and say, I'm not really a massive video gamer. I was the one who annoyed people by taking the consoles apart and trying to see what was inside and see if we could patch them back together and improve them. So I might not have been your favorite friend at school. Like, Alan, we just want to play the game, you know. Mark, over to you. Hi, I'm Mark Jordazak. I'm the Managing Director of uh, Bradford-based Gaslight Games. Uh, I'm also a uh, programmer, lead programmer on, on a whole bunch of games more recently. Um, I'd say my favourite game of all time, probably The Witcher 3 or the 1980s Joust, the uh, arcade game. Uh, wherever I go to arcade club, that is the one that I just sit on for hours and hours. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably my, those are my favourites. Hi, I'm Esther Lashman. I am curriculum content developer for Digital Schoolhouse, and um, we are part of UKI, which is the UK trade body for the games industry. Um, I also work part time as a teacher as well, so I teach computing to a primary school. Um, my favourite game was probably Kingdom Hearts One. Um, I just love the crossover of um, Disney and Final Fantasy. Um, so yeah, that's probably my favourite. Oh, me. Yep. yep. Hi, uh, Rob Lehman. I um, work for Arm, which is a technology company. Uh, my favourite game of all time is uh, Civ 6 at the moment. 
I'm playing an awful lot of that. I spend my time uh, doing educational stuff within the schools program at Arm. Uh, I do a lot of stuff with uh, with CAS and uh, as well. And Nikki. I am Nikki Donino. I am a principal lecturer in computer science. I'm academic lead of computing at the University of Central Lancashire. And I'm, <laughs> Alan, my favourite game. You can't ask that question. Well, um, if you were going, if you're going to a desert island, then you're only asked to take one. I don't know. It depends which console I'm taking with me. Like, you know, if it's a first Xbox, Xbox, it would probably be Halo. Um, if it was an old PC, it'd be Doom. Um, PlayStation 2 would be the last of us. But maybe now, actually, maybe Destiny. I'd go for Destiny. Okay. So, so you the, can see a theme there, can't you, really? Great. <laughs> now, some people might think, why is it important for us to know? Well, these are meant to be social events. And at the moment, it's not so easy for us to meet socially in person. You could say impossible. So I'm hoping that, you know, when you're watching this, whether you're on live on YouTube, be part of the panel, you might make some new friends. And it may be that, I don't know, you come to a future and say, oh, by the way, Mark is now designing a game for me. Or, or oh, through Estelle, I found this. So look up our guests later on and you'll find that they've all got lots of interest in angles and opinions and, and, and things to help. So we'll start with our first question. So anybody can start off here. You don't have to put your hand up. We're not in school. Did anybody have a favorite scene or a clip or story? And we're going to focus mostly on episode one, which is called Boomer Bust. Although if you saw something in episode five or six that you really want to recommend us to go and persevere through the whole two hours to get there, then tell us. Shall I jump in first? Um, my favourite scene probably in the very in that first episode was I just loved it when um, you met uh, Tomohiro uh, Nishikado, who is the creator of Space Invaders. And he was like talking about how he designed the characters and he had just this lovely little book. And he was like talking about how he had to open it very delicately um, because it had been obviously looked and leafed through so often. Um, and it just made me so pleased to see like flow charts in there and he'd like drawn all the characters out and then he'd worked out how um, he was going to convert the little characters into pixel art and he did all the things in that that the students like hate doing in school and it just got me really excited because I thought actually what a brilliant clip to show students you know that you know this is this is one of the ways that people actually do this in the real world I mean yes we're looking at an older game but you know, when we say to you, write a flowchart to plan this out, it's not because we want to make you do really boring pieces of work. And just to stick with that for a moment, Estelle, one of those things I'm always thinking is, can I relate this to the computing curriculum? And there's a topic that we, we, we cover called data representation. And he says like, oh, so I started off, it's going to be like this octopus with three legs. And how could I, and, you know, I had eight pixels to fit it into. And you can see all those kind of challenges is having to think about, oh, and then he came up with another idea for another thing and he realized no, that was going to be so he, so it was showing about the balance between using what was available and what his imagination wanted to carry off so Estelle's got that one anybody else a favorite scene story facts or something that was revealed um, I, I loved I loved the unsung hero by uh, Jerry Lawson the actual inventor of the cartridges you know I'd never even heard of the channel f and then finding out that, that not only was it, you know, he was an inventor before Atari did it, but he was six foot six, somebody even bigger than me. So that, I just, I, I adored that, that whole scene, that whole the, um, I thought the way they did that was really done less like, because he's not around to tell the story or to say, hey, I was the one who did that. And it's his children. And it's like they're saying about how they, you know, how they feel. Um, and I, I don't know if anybody else wants to cut in here at this point, but one thing I think the series does really well is in terms of gender balance, uh, BAME, there, you, you will struggle a little bit with the video games industry because it's dominated by people who look like me, old, grey, bald, heterosexual males. And I think they, they do go a little bit further into looking beyond those kind of stereotypes. Actually, I... Uh... Yeah. Sorry, I, Nikki, binge on, watched, I binge watched the entire thing over two days so I've yeah. seen all of it and at the end of it I thought you know I'm, I'm really glad I watched that I really enjoyed it I love the the infill graphics that they produce for part of the show but my lasting impression was that the gender balance was horrific ah okay <laughs> if you pay close attention to it the apart from one female programmer who um, is a trans person 
the rest of them, none of them were programmers, the women. They were like, I'm going to draw a lovely game, but my husband is going to implement it for me. You know, so I thought the gender balance could have been better. And maybe that stemmed from maybe budget constraints because they obviously only interviewed a couple of people and then reused those interviews across all the episodes. And there are lots of women who were part of the software development world in the 70s and the 80s. And I'm sure some of them may be fed maybe indirectly into the games industry, but you need to dig a little bit deeper to find them. Yep. And they, they did make quite a big play about, um, obviously it was great to have a, a black gay man on there and he repeated that several times, but there was there were no female developers that I saw unless I missed them. I mean, it's an absolutely uh, fair point that the, I think they'd gone some way to try to, but you're, you're saying they could have gone much further. And what about the little yeah. geeky boys who won all the competitions and all the little geeky boys in the audience? Because that's yeah. all you saw was bunches of geeky boys, didn't you? <laughs> I do think that was partially because it was very much of its time in terms of it being 80s um, sort of competitions. And unfortunately, that even now is still something that's still quite difficult to to break down that kind of idea that computer games especially competitions it's we digital schoolhouse runs an esports tournament every year and as much we really really try to encourage as many girls to take part as possible but it's still really really hard um because there's still a sort of a bit of a stigmatism against that girls feel that it's a boys thing to do um so yeah I think that partially was I, I completely agree with you but I'm 46 and I was there so you okay. know I'm off the time so I, th I think whilst you're right it, it would have been challenging to show that gender diversity is not impossible and I felt that maybe they could have made a little bit more of an effort I think it's also interesting so much uh, about what our view of a, a gamer is as well because for a lot of people actually they game they play things like candy crush they might pick up something for five ten minutes on the bus or on the train and actually they're enjoying video games but perhaps our view is it has to take place on this big console in front of a telly and that's our, our, our only perception of what gaming is as well and uh, i think perhaps we moved on that's so interesting yeah because people think if you're not a serious gamer you're not a gamer but actually the Wii console introduced more women into gaming than any other console in history because of Wii Fit. Wii Fit at the time sold more units per game than, than any other game in history and it was women that were buying it. Mm. Does that mean they're not a gamer? <laughs> my mom bought a Wii Fit in what world would my mom ever buy a games console? <laughs> there was a reference to Ms Pac-Man early on but it didn't necessarily it's not portrayed necessarily as a oh here if we do this this will help you know address the gender imbalance in some way it's kind of Alan, like oh we're gonna have a copyright issue let's call it something else i'll tell you who was cool though sonia from mortal kombat she right. was cool she could Which kick episode the boys is that, is that five they meld into one another oh okay <laughs> well, certainly Rob, in one of you the later gonna... episodes oh. they interviewed john romero and uh, his wife, Brenda Romero, who has been in the video games industry for longer than he has. <laughs> and so it was just kind of, I mean, she's wonderful, she's absolutely fantastic and, and so much knowledge. And it just felt a little like, you've asked John, but like Brenda has got just as much information, if not more. And it's not about Doom, sure, but it's, it, there's so much in the industry that, that I feel it could have been portrayed. And certainly if you're a teacher, if you want to try and do this, I'm probably going to get shot down for this now, but <laughs> you, you, you might not say to your class, right, we're going to watch all six of them. You might selectively pick out a few. And it may be that it just so happens to be 50-50 representation of male, female. Um, and there was, there was other sort of underrepresented minorities represented as well. Like, um, I've forgotten her first name now. Was it Nancy Eineman? Uh, right at the beginning... Um, forgot the first name, Rob. I think you were going to pop in with your favourite scene, and we've yeah. The uh, yeah. the bit that stuck out to me was the was was actually uh, yeah, Nancy uh, Hanley really won the um, uh, the space invasion thing at the beginning when she was talking about the flow state and how you know, sports people get into it, and it's that balance of sort of interaction, excitedness, and simplicity that uh, keeps people 
highly engaged for long periods of time and get lots cracked through. And, and you certainly see that in gaming. And I, I sometimes get lost when you're playing things and, you know, several hours will go by and you, you wonder where. And you see this in education as well, when students are really, really engaged in a, in a topic, particularly when they're playing around with things like, um, you know, like hardware and trying to solve problems. And it's getting that balance right between engagement and uh, keeping them on track educationally and doing, doing things with computers. And it's a, uh, I think that's really, really interesting because you can see that flow state in students when they're learning just as you can when they're playing games but it's, it's difficult to do it's difficult to capture and it's difficult to assess but it's, it's fascinating when you see it happen and it's, it's almost magical when in the classroom and you know because you can feel it in the air when, when a class are, are buzzing like that and are really engaging with a, with a, with a topic or, or a problem i'm sure when i first started playing skyrim i emerged three days later <laughs> and i was like what happened <laughs> you're forgetting to eat it's uh, yeah <laughs> Nikki, you mentioned before you like the animated titles, and uh, me speaking as a non-gamer, I'd say they were, they looked to me like they must they were have a NES sixty four kind of. Era they were bit they were... mapped images. I think that yeah. was why it suited, and it's really interesting because if you follow the journey through and you watch all of them, you can see the graphics improving as they go along. All oh, right, okay, and, uh, and the challenges they had with with the 8-bit machines and the 8-bit consoles and being able to program in them. So, yeah, I really liked the graphics. I thought they did a really good job with them. And the I don't know if any of you watched the last episode where the two um, guys who worked for the 3D company went to Japan and they did the little characters of them. And the younger lad said, oh, I was 18 and I felt like a baby and his character turned into a baby and fell onto the table. <laughs> I thought that was quite funny. So I was going to suggest that they, as they've put this docu-series together, they've used a range of, um, you could say, clip styles. So there's the animations in between, there's interviews with people telling stories about, you know, from their history of working in video games development. There's a nice tool that I've noticed or a technique that they use where they say, um, oh, and there I was, I came up with this idea. And the, the person telling the story nowadays is, is you drawing the thing and it's almost like we're watching them doing it for the first time. I thought that worked interestingly. And then there's, then there's live game action. And sometimes the game action, it's like it's artificially created to suit the way that the program is going. And then, um, and then there's these archive TV clips where the, the screen changes down into like a four, three format. And, um, and they've recreated, there was one bit, there was people who were like games advisors and they, puts a wig on to try and make him all look hip. Do, do you think it worked or do you think one of those elements works stronger than the other? We've talked about the animation, like the interviews. The... I, I really liked them, but I've got to admit, the one that stuck in my mind was when they were talking about Doom and how they wanted to make it really scary. And then they went to a shot of John Romero running around his garden with some hedge trimmers in his hand <laughs> trying to look scary. <laughs> I was still thinking that just doesn't work. <laughs> Does anybody, did anybody watch that one and remember it? Yeah, I'd, I'd forgot, forgot on the scene actually. I'd, I watched the whole series back when it first came out, but I only watched the first one again the other day. But yeah, that, now you mentioned it, that, that was pretty awful. <laughs> In one of the episodes, there's a gentleman, uh, maybe I'll have to find it now. It's the role playing one, it's episode three. And um, this particular gentleman, it might, get, it might be Richard Garriott, if I've got it right. But when they meet him first, he's holding a skull up and he puts all these different costumes on. He's playing a game with himself, like a Dungeons and Dragons. And, and he's talking about, it. it's virgin on cosplay, I would say. Um, I thought, gosh, they've really had some nerve to produce this programme. Like, Mark, we're going to do something with you now. Would you, would you dress up in a ballet dress? And then would you dress up as one of your characters in your game? I thought they... They've, they've been afforded quite a lot of license in the filming of it. Almost makes me think that he volunteered for that. <laughs> Those are things he's got lying around his house. I mean, this sounds like fun, to be honest. And I yeah. think he's what is he, he's a very good dungeon master as well. So I, I think it would be something that would be, yeah. And it's a bit that we remember as well. So that's that's the whole point of these kinds of things. Uh, all, all the, uh, whenever I've played D&D, &D, the mostly half cost players anyway, everybody dresses up <laughs> to play. <laughs> I really liked that episode, the role-playing one. Um, I also really loved, having talked about Final Fantasy earlier, I really loved the um, how they showed how the artwork has like, um, developed across the series. 
um, and how originally obviously the artwork had to be really sort of scaled back in terms of um, it being more like a pic like pixel art to start with um, and how it's become more and more like his actual vision of what it would look like and I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. I really like the move to uh, to pixel art, especially with like Minecraft, for example, that kind of really popularised it in the in the sort of the, in the general public. And and now you're seeing a sort of a flip from pixel art and trying to apply much more modern graphical technology, like with RTX and uh, you know ray tracing, and trying to add that into Minecraft. And it's a sort of a, a clashing of worlds almost, but it, it works really really well. And like Super Meat Boy, another good example. What I was a little bit disappointed in, and maybe it was outside the remit of the show, but. It was meant to be about classic games, wasn't it? And I felt that I wanted a little bit more and I would have liked to have seen it come up to modern times. And it goes back to what um, Estelle was saying about the, the artwork. And so at my university, we actually run two games courses. One of them is games development and the other one is games design. And we are very clear that actually to work on those big titles, it's very unlikely that one person will work on both sides. You're either a developer or you're an artist. And I think it wasn't that clear in this show. It was kind of melting a little bit together. And maybe that's because they didn't get up to like the big titles that we know now, where it's probably impossible to be able to program or develop art at that level. So I would have liked to have seen it come up to, to modern times. What do the rest of yeah. you think? It seemed like yeah, I, in them days, you could be a, you could do everything, couldn't you? And just make a game with one person. <laughs> yeah, I had to read through some of the, the reviews before tonight. And the, I think the two two things that sort of stood out were that it it didn't cover everything and uh, uh, pur purposely so to some extent there are documentaries out there that go into to much more depth but also <coughs> perhaps that they could have things they looked at they could have gone deeper still in it. but then there are other documentaries if you want to go further so like the digging up of the et cartridges there's the atari game over documentary where they actually uh, go into the the desert and they they find all these things that have been buried and talk about how they then uh, preserve them as well. But the the other one was that it maybe didn't go new enough and and um, actually address how games are developed nowadays. Well, if you're going to direct students towards it, I think my students would have wanted to learn more about how can I become that developer? How can I get into the industry? And that's where that gap was. They were talking about people who had made it into the industry, but it probably is not relevant to, to current students, is it? Because the role is very different now. Mm. I think it was, it was very high level in sort of everything that it showed you really. It was sort of the, the sort of the more of the, um, oh, sort of the thought process behind sort of the beginnings of series and it, so yeah it wasn't quite as you say it, it didn't go into the nitty-gritty but I remember seeing a, a video I can't remember what it was in but it was this guy talking about what he'd been doing and he worked in this studio and and he's he like I've been working on this for two years and then it shows you what he's been working on it's this guy diving off a, a cliff and that's it that's literally it it's like 30 seconds not even 30 seconds long this guy diving off um, and the reality is that probably if that was what one of the episodes was going to be, just lots of people talking about this tiny little bit that they did in a game, probably wouldn't be quite as exciting to watch. There's an introduction and accessibility to get people to, to be interested in video games. I think if you if you want to get that deeper dive, you know, there, there's the gamers channel on YouTube, there's no clip. Um, you know, the Grateful Honor documentary that's on Netflix as well dives into a huge amount and that's kind of a warts and all you know really covers a lot of the, the negative aspects that happen as you're making a 300 person studio size game so i think as as an introduction i think it's fantastic i, I really I, I enjoyed the whole the whole series i agree that it, it can't it didn't go into too much detail but i can say 99 percent of people even in the industry if i talk about what i do they're going to get bored to tears that one percent is going to be eyes open loving it jumping up and down but the most folks really not yeah, and I think and that's it, what this, this comes yeah. as well. It also kind of um, ignited some memories that I'd forgotten I had, which is really nice, wasn't it? You know, that nostalgic element. And was it Night Trap? I'd forgotten Night Trap. How could I have forgotten Night Trap? <laughs> well, just <laughs> sticking with nostalgia for a moment. So <laughs> I would say from people of a certain age, like I'm holding the nostalgic item in my hand at the moment, when we see things like this, oh, do you remember, oh, Neil, do you remember when we were, oh, and Neil will pretend he's not as old as I am and that kind of thing. So it's, it is nice for us to watch it as an elves, but I'm wondering how valuable or how useful it might be, it, it, you know, all the 
at reports we read that there's a recruitment shortage in video games, interactive entertainment. We need more people. You know, Mark might struggle to to recruit the kind of people he needs to come and work with him. Do you think that high score in any way might inspire young minds to consider study or careers in video games? <laughs> Blank <laughs> looks. <laughs> I, I would Can you so. imagine children watching it going, oh, I so want to do that. I, I, like when um, Nash, Nishikado says, I, I started off with a piece of paper and, then a, and now I've made this game and I've made millions or something from it. Do you think it serves well in that way to inspire young minds? Um, I'm, I don't think so. I mean, it's what I went to back before. I think it's far too removed from the current millennium to, to really be anything for them. I think it's more aimed at people like us so that we can be nostalgic about what went on. And, and for me, certainly, the one message that it did send, which I can talk to students about, is that the games that you're playing now, like Destiny, uh, you know, all the really fancy games that run on, on consoles, that's where they all started. And actually these games would never exist without that because computing is, is an applied science and it's also cumulative science. We learn from things that we do and we get better and better. And it would never have happened if we hadn't had Chucky Egg. Does anybody remember Chucky Egg? <laughs> you know, so I think, I think that, that's a, a really good message to talk to people yeah. about. I think the other thing that comes across sort of throughout it is the idea of like tinkering and there's so much of it that came about from um, like the, the guys in the very first episode who designs like the add-on kit so that they or could make the control, arcade games yeah. harder um, and then you know there were several instance, instances throughout the whole series of people who'd taken another game and developed something that sort of around it or using it in some way um and I, that made me think that maybe that's something that actually students might be quite um inspired by mm -hmm. that you know you can have a look at what's already there and and in, make improvements on it if you want yeah. students to tinker get them to build a 3d printer my 3d printer spends more time broken than it does actually printing <laughs> but you know <laughs> that, that's a good tinkering um up-to-date topical um item they can play with rather than i guess i mean i've still got on my shelf my older uh, Spectrum 48K, I'm not sure they would be interested in playing with that. It, it needs to be something that's up to date, doesn't no, it? No, no, I disagree with you on that. Um, we've got a little bit of a computing museum at my school and um, we've got a few, we've got um, uh, Dragon 32, um, we've got a few other um, older bits of tech and they work and the kids absolutely love using them. We've even got an old typewriter and they are really like, they just find it fascinating um like just to see how it works and sort of yeah so actually i do i disagree with you they do like to have a play around with old tech if they especially the idea that they can actually get hands on with it um, we took a group of students to the computing museum at um, bletchley park and there they do a whole lesson using the old bbc's and they get into program in bbc basic and they make a snake game and again they absolutely loved it because it's so different it, you know, they feel like they're almost stepping into an alien world because it's just, it's so different to what they're used to. If that's yeah. the case, it sounds like we've got a, a new project for Alan because obviously we've got a lot of old tech that ends up on the rubbish heap. Maybe we can find a way of recycling it yeah. and making it available to schools. You Ooh. need to subscribe to Hello World magazine, Nikki, and I'll tell you which issue it is, but there's one all about building your own computing museum. Now, I have asked our audience to send in questions and and they've sent some in. So I have a pile of questions myself, but I'm gonna tell you what these are. So first of all, I'm gonna warn Estelle and Neil, we're gonna to go to them first with this, <laughs> second, we're gonna to go to them second with this question so they can think about it. So question we've had from Rachel is, what would you say to parents who are concerned about their teenagers' gaming habits to persuade them that there can be a positive side to it? So that's to think about, we'll come back to you. And this next question coming up, we're going to see if Mark or Rob can help with this one. It's one of the most surprising things that you learned from the series. So we'll go with that. One of the most surprising things, and then we'll go to Neil and Estelle in a moment with the parents who are concerned what would be the positive side. Something that surprised you, Rob? 
think the, uh, the the surprise of it was this: how kids just aren't aware of like arcades and that they even exist anymore. And like uh, kids, they, when you when I when I when I was teaching and you speak to them about arcades, they think it just means like two P machines. And how uh, in the documentary at the beginning, it certainly mentions you know, this is somewhere where adults used to go and spend their recreation time, and it was aimed at adults. And consoles certainly back in the old new well, PS One and things like that, the games are very much marketed to that, and it's kind of slowly been the age range of who consumes console games is, is getting uh, lower and lower. And look at things like Fortnite; it's uh, almost key stage three. Uh, and and that sort that was interesting how uh, the sort of the the uh, the market has shifted and age range has, has shifted and that um, uh, made me start thinking about things like game mechanics like uh, loot boxes and, and things like that and how uh, you you bring in this moral and social element of uh, our loot boxes gambling and now you know that's been legislated uh, in the EU and how it, you know uh, that that sort of mechanism is, is, is even seen as exploitative in, in in some regards and so, so it, got, it got me thinking about those sorts of things and how games are being monetized in almost inappropriate ways uh, and how that's um detracting from what games should be about it's about having fun not just you know gener generating endless revenue for things like uh, skins and the like and you see that with things like roblox and, and those sorts of games um where it's all about driving revenue rather than playing and even though kids really enjoy it they're almost missing a trick through by only engaging in that one type of game so yeah that's a, a bit of a tangent but that's a, that's what that's what made mark me think would about. you would you agree with that somebody who works in the games industry is it primarily driven by revenue there are certainly large parts of it. The, the project I'm working on right now, the focus of the development is entirely on what is the game, making it good, making them every every se separate loop. So we consider not just the main core loop, but the, the meta loops and the side loops and all these other things that one can consider. Um, but, but revenue and uh, that has to come back to business. Uh, it's the only way that we can keep the lights on and, and keep paying mortgages and, and all those kinds of things. So. I would certainly say that. One thing I would say, though, is on arcades, because there's an arcade club in Berry, which is outside Manchester. There's one in Leeds now, and sadly, obviously, they're closed at the moment. Um, but those are every generation, all generations, whatever, have gone in. In fact, had to queue outside because they have a one in, one out policy for fire safety rates. Um, but I love that, that, you know, 10 pounds, no, no more pound points, 50p, 10 pounds all day, and my record is seven and a half hours. Um, but I'm 6'4", and the cabinets are a lot lower, so my back gives out. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's easy to forget how good and exciting actually going into an arcade was compared to what we had at home. Obviously, the gap now is, well, maybe even now better at home. But the, the technology that you would actually go into an arcade to play with was incredible. There was, a, there was lots of stories that were I found in the very first episodes that were very, very helpful. I, I thought in, I could see me using them in a teaching context. So, for example, we talked about, Estelle mentioned the mission control hack that they did and it was this all came around a business problem they had they were they were living in dorms at university and they found that they could generate some revenue from owning these machines and collecting them but then there was one particular game and so we could put a quarter in and they could play for hours for 25 cents and i thought we're gonna have to do something about this it's killing our income so um while rob there must be some truth in what Rob was saying is it's very much revenue driven. It was, but it actually forced them to innovate and go away. And they said people were happy to put more quarters in because they were actually getting, you can almost say more bang for their book. They, they, they were, okay, it's them telling us that's what happened. So we do have to rely on, on their word to an extent. And I was talking to my son the other day, who's bitterly disappointed. He's been waiting months and he's, he's coming up to 24 He's been waiting months to get hold of his new Xbox. And, you know, surely if that company was purely revenue driven, they'd have had warehouses full of these things ready to, to ship out. But um, I, I don't know, maybe it's all balanced. I, I just want to know, because you, you are touching on something that's endemic in the games industry and actually the software industry as a whole, and that's intellectual property. And, you know, even though, yes, it was really fun to hack console, you know, the people who own that game, <laughs> you know, that's their intellectual property and yeah. they shouldn't have done that. <laughs> that's right. There's, there's, and that, that has been massively complicated. And that's another thread that comes through the series quite a lot, like the, the lawsuit with Atari and then what they did as a result of that. And, um, okay, there was a question okay. I asked earlier. Oh. Go on, Sorry, Mark. I, I think we're on, on that with what those guys did with the enhancement kits, though, is that we've got to remember that Counter-Strike and uh, Dota, Dota 2, 
and I'm, I'm running out of games that are right now off the top of my head, but they were all mods. And what they did with the enhancement kit was the very first mod. And so without that, we wouldn't have some of the most popular esports games right now um, if, if they hadn't sort of set that precedent that Atari had gone, gone through and had won, we'd never even have these games right now. And it, there's resonances of it now with the sort of the Apple approach to things and the, the Google Android approach and the, you have this lockdown system and this system that's purported to be open. You know. Rachel's question for Neil and Estelle, right? What are you going to say to these parents concerns their teenagers' gaming habits to persuade them there can actually be a positive side to gaming. Anybody else chip in once Neil and Estelle? Um, I think as with everything, it has to be a balance, which is something that Alan and I were actually talking about earlier today, which is quite interesting that this would come up again. Um, and I think as a parent, you have a responsibility to make yourself aware of, of what your child is doing. So, how, you know, get out there, go on the internet, have a look at what they're, what they're playing. There's really good websites out there like Ask About Games, which you can go on and have a look at different titles, read about them, find out what the content is. Make sure you know what the PEGI rating is of the game, the games that your, your kids are playing. You know, if, if you, one of the things that I find quite often um, when I go and do digital schoolhouse workshops is we'll, we'll do something where we're asking the student, the kids about what games they're playing. And then that's always really interesting what they tell you they're playing. And these are primary school age students and they'll, and you get one or two every, every time that will tell they tell you they play GTA. And you then have to report that to the primary teacher and explain what GTA is and why that might be a little bit of a worrying thing when you're teaching a year five class. And normally what then transpires is actually they've, they've watched an, a, an older brother or sister or they've watched their parents or playing the game and it's not at all they've just even just seen the case they haven't actually played it at all um but i think having a dialogue making sure you're actually talking and one of the things it sounds like a really it's one of the probably the simplest things to do is have a con have the console somewhere where you're using it as a family that it's not tucked away in a bedroom if you're if you're worried about it bring it into the open so you're actually playing together and talking together and it becomes something that you do as a family um yeah so I'll, I'll pass over to Neil I've kind of like yes yeah you've, you've taken everything Estelle thanks oh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> no no I, I'm only joking I'm, yeah I, I certainly agree with what you said uh it, the other bits about finding out about them actually having a go yourself yeah. uh, with your child uh, I think is good and the the balance thing is certainly important but I think the other thing to bear in mind is that although they perhaps are playing a game, actually it might be their way to socialise and uh, keep in touch with our friends, and particularly the current situation. I know we've got a 13-year-old lad over the road who enjoys playing Fortnite, um, but actually it's the fact that it's the way he communicates with his friends during the day once they're done with school and they chill out and relax and he's got no other way to meet them. And at the minute it's quite a, an extreme uh, situation, but there are... The, the the social perhaps collaborative uh, benefits um, as well in it and uh, as we get a little bit deeper things around problem solving and uh, how to actually persevere be resilient and so on and so forth but cert certainly a balance is needed yeah I mean we talked a little bit earlier about flow and actually there's there's a lot of things that the education system could learn from computer games to make um, education more fun and more engaging for students. So you know, um, there's there are some some games out there that perhaps you maybe wouldn't want your your child playing depending on their age. But there is a, there's loads and loads of amazing games out there that they can use. They can learn. They can um, inspire. Be inspired from them. Is it not about putting everything in context? Because I think it was a one of the kids that was interviewed in the show said, oh, um, I don't mind shooting games because shooting people in a game is better than shooting people in real life or something along those lines. But um, going back to um, what Neil was talking about, the social aspect, I do think that a lot of parents don't realise that actually you can use games to communicate with people. Mm -hmm. And it's all about stranger danger as well, isn't it? So I play Among Us with my godchildren, but their parents know they're playing with me. Yeah. They're not allowed to just play with a bunch of strangers. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a great game among us. It's so simple and it just That's goes really to show how game. simplicity works. But I think what makes it really um, successful is that social aspect, isn't it? There's, 
I still remember parents' evenings, parents sitting down and saying, I'm so fed up with my teenage son, daughter. All they ever do is play games. They never show an interest in anything. They're on that games console all the time. I said, but you're saying they never show an interest in anything. What kind of games do they play? Oh, I don't know. They just do. And, and you know, if you want to introduce learning or, or, or something, maybe that's a good place to start. Well, which kind of games is it you're playing? Oh, and, and, and it's, I think some parents are terrified of, starting those conversations it, 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 you know and um just to be interested in something doesn't mean you have to actually be good at it you know if you'd see me play a game then oh, i don't know we could probably sell tickets that'd be very entertaining maybe <laughs> and and what well, if they were playing with lego or meccano would that be okay but but building something in, in minecraft fortnite no that's 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 not good enough oh well, you... lego was pretty good wasn't it <laughs> you remember that one mm, yeah virtual lego games no no the star wars lego one. Oh, sorry okay star wars I really lego game. That one. <laughs> okay so we are getting close to our final minutes of our panel discussion this evening there was a couple more things i i wanted you to consider um nikki you mentioned binge watching that didn't strike me as a series you would binge watch anybody think it's one you could comfortably binge watch anybody I else watched it as well yeah as a binge <laughs> yeah I, but yeah i just yeah. i i just couldn't stop watching so oh, okay. I, uh, I watched all of it <laughs> mark yeah. you didn't nod uh for, first time around uh, when it came out what's uh, september yeah all of them uh, I think it was over about two, two days, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah we did two days. Yeah. It's about two and a half hours, I think, if you put... No, it's less. It must be two hours or so if you put it all together. So it, I suppose it is a bit like a film. No, it's two and a half. I could, I kept wanting to pause all the time. And, you know, when they were telling... I thought, really? Is that really... I wanted to go on Wikipedia and fact check. And it t- took me two hours to get through the first episode. Well, Alan, that's because you haven't mastered the art of double screening, which is what you <laughs> see and looking stuff up on Wikipedia at the same time. Yeah, I'm obviously a, from one of those generations that, does, that letters weren't even invented. Because you Rob nodding. Are you a double screener <laughs> like I am? I want uh, three screens now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so advanced. Really. Okay. <laughs> Um, we talked a lot about episode one. Was there an, a, an, an, a one particular episode that really stood out for anybody on our panel? The, uh, the Mega Drive, yeah, the, the, or the Genesis, as they called it in the, uh, in the US. It's this five is, point plan and being stormed out of the Japanese office. I think this is episode four. So Sega's aggressive push to outsell Nintendo. Yeah, that was, Make so that was my concern. <laughs> There was, did anybody notice a little bit of trivia? Let me notice who the narrator was of the series. Yes, the voice of Mario. It was. <laughs> and there's a, there's a whole wiki page all about his career being the voice of Mario. And he was the voice of other characters as well. And how he, how he, he got into that, which I, I haven't seen it yet, but I don't know whether that's an element of the series. I think it should be in there when you read... <laughs> Go, go and read the wiki page, Charles Martinet, uh, it's a, or spelt like Martinet. Any final points? Uh, like, is it, oh, sorry, is it generally a thumbs up, the high score, or is it thumbs down, or, yeah, we're getting a thumbs up, okay. Any final points before we wrap this up? I found that uh, once I watched it, I then had to go and dig out my Pi Cade and then rewire it all and to make sure it worked. And then spent several hours uh, catching up on the back catalogue of all the old arcade games that I've not played on and that were, and that were in the show as well, particularly uh, Kirby's Dreamland. Yeah, I, I've recently got one of these, which um, is a has a Raspberry Pi Zero in the back there. Um, and then you play uh, lots so of the, games. Apparently, tell us, Neil, is this a product you can buy or you've yeah, bought an old re- Nintendo retro Game Boy flagged GPI case? Called. I still have actually my original Game Boy, my Game Boy Color. So, and I've, I've probably got about 400 tapes for my Spectrum 48K with uh, things like Delhi Thompson's Decathlon. I don't know if anyone remembers that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah joystick hammer one, the yeah. keys on the keyboard. <laughs> Alan, I think you've seen some of my retro game collection, haven't you? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Nick, uh, at Nikki's book launch. And Mark, I imagine you you must have a house full of games. <laughs> I I've been in this in the throes of moving house, and I actually have a storage unit, and it's got my Borderlands Two Ultimate Loot Chest, my Fallout Four, Pip Boy, 
Uh, we've got a portal gun. Uh, it's all coming out prior to the place when we finally move. But like, I've only got a few things here behind me, sort of like munch and aid. I, don't, don't, <laughs> I can't have those go into storage. Um, so I've just got so and a bunch of stuff that I managed to get a swag from GBC, which uh, not being able to go for a couple of years now is a bit, you know, makes me sad. I feel apart from the, the the business side of of the decision because there, it comes with its own dis, um, um, repercussions, the fact that consoles are moving towards digital downloads only is a little bit of a shame because it was nice to buy the games and have them all lined up, wasn't it? So, and I think that obviously the new Xbox and the new uh, PlayStation all have uh, digital download only options rather than the physical drive. It is still an option with the Xbox. You can go one or the because other. They're phasing. They're phasing yeah. us out, aren't they? <laughs> and Listen, we're talking about the business stuff. That's entirely a business decision. The physical stuff is, costs yeah. so much, and it, yeah, it is a shame. Yeah. Right, everybody. Thank you for giving up your time to share your reflections on High Score. We are doing another one of these next month. Anybody know what film we're looking at next month? Estelle, you should know. Yeah, Hackers. Um, yeah, really looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. we're going to be watching I think I've Hackers. seen that film over 10 times. I love <laughs> Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't get old, does it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I need to find some buttons to stop this live thing on YouTube. Oh, so we're going to say goodbye to the YouTube 